Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first ever Citizen Science Asia webinar organized jointly by Citizen Science Asia and SciStarter. My name is Adrian, a member of Citizen Science Asia. Um, and uh, today's webinar theme is biodiversity. And this is in celebration of Citizen Science Month, as well as sort of a kickoff to City Nature Challenge, which began today. So get out there and work for your cities to get some posts and the spots in for iNaturalist Citizen Science uh, City Nature Challenge. And so we're going to have a brief introduction about Citizen Science Month by SciStarter, followed by an introduction to the Citizen Science Asia community. And then we're going to introduce the keynote speakers and begin that. So I did send a link in the comment section, if you scroll up to the beginning of the comments, and it's a webinar resource document that you can look at. Um, it kind of gives a brief introduction about the keynote speakers and some resources you can look out to learn more about the community of citizen scientists in Asia. And now I want to hand over the platform to Caroline from SciStarter, who's going to give a brief introduction about what Citizen Science Month is. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Adrian, And thank you to Citizen Science Asia for um, the work that you do. And um, we just we're so happy to be doing this. I've been really looking forward to it. Um, I put in the chat the YouTube link in case you all want to share this with your friends and family um, who may not be on Zoom. Zoom is definitely the best seat for this whole thing because you're going to be able to take part in our chat box and our interactive poll, but the recording will be available afterward too. Looks like someone just messaged in the Q&A and said, we will get certification of participation of this good webinar. Um, I don't think we have a certificate made up, but You'll definitely be able to refer back to that YouTube link and um, send it out to other people if you want to share what you learned about biodiversity. Um, so yeah, let me go ahead and get started. So hey everybody, I'm Caroline and I'm with the SciStarter team. I'm based in Washington, DC, um, but I'm originally from Orlando, Florida and um, Asia definitely has a soft spot in my heart. I studied uh, Mandarin Chinese as an undergraduate and at the University of Florida. Um, and I'm just really passionate about citizen science, which is public engagement and real research. So during this presentation, if you want to post on Twitter or Instagram or any of your accounts um, about your excitement with this, please use the hashtag SitSciMonth to kind of spread the word. SitSciMonth is something we do each year. It used to be Citizen Science Day, but we decided, you know, a day is not enough for all of our excitement. We need a whole month. And we also did the month because we wanted to be more inclusive of international participants. I think that's a choice that's really paid off. Um, in this month alone, we've done a webinar with citizen scientists in Nigeria. Um, we've uh, shared our Twitter accounts with the European Citizen Science Association and representatives from the Citizen Science Association of Australia. Um, and we've had a number of events, online events added to SciStarter from all different time zones all over the world. So if you like this event and you're like, you know, I want more, I want to attend more recordings, um, you can go to citizenscienceMonth.org and at the bottom of that page, you'll see all the remaining events, including um, something you'll hear about later today, the City Nature Challenge. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and how much I love citizen science and SciStarter. So to kick us off, I'm gonna go ahead and launch a live poll. So I just wanna know um, of people attending, have you attended, um, not have you attended, have you participated in citizen science projects before? So please feel free to vote. We have two no's, oh my gosh, that's really interesting. But we got a few yeses coming in. Keep voting, keep on voting. No, I'm not sure as yet. I think people are pretty sure, yes or no. All right, this is your last chance to get your votes in. Three, two, one. I'm about to close the poll. Last chance for real. End poll. So we're at about a 50-50 split of people who have done citizen science and people who haven't. Well, no matter what, you're in the right place. Because um, we're going to explain to you how you can get started with citizen science in Asia. So we'll do one more poll just to get some more information about who you are. So I'm going to launch this one now. So I want to know, you know, and you can check all that apply. Are you an aspiring citizen scientist, a parent of an aspiring citizen scientist, a teacher, educator, community leader, a librarian, or part of a library staff, just a bored person on the internet, or none of these? 
All right, so keep on voting. Got quite a few community leaders in here. This is great. All right, I'm going to leave the poll up for a few more seconds to let you all have a chance to vote. All right, three, two, one, last chance to get those votes in. And we're going to end the poll. So it looks like the majority of people here are teachers, educators, or community leaders. So to everyone who's here, um, including our board people on the internet, welcome. Um, we hope that you'll be able to learn something today. So Citizen Science Month, I mentioned that, you know, it's an effort throughout April to celebrate citizen science, which is real science that anybody can do. So I always say that citizen science is a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. And citizen science basically encompasses any way a person, just a regular person, a member of the public, can volunteer to bring science forward. So that can be everything through taking an observation through iNaturalist, which you'll learn about later today, and contributing to a global record of biodiversity, to doing a project like Stall Catchers, which is one of our featured citizen science Month projects, where you classify blood vessels and speed up the search for a cure to Alzheimer's disease. And you do that completely um, from your computer from home. So citizen science is really diverse. I say it's everything from astronomy to zoology um, and everything in between. It's every single di discipline of science from the study of bugs to the study of microbes to the study of health and disease. And the reason why it exists is because there are certain types of research that scientists can't do without you. They need your help to um, move the world forward and create new knowledge. So like I said, hashtag sit um, We have a number of graphics too. If you wanna use those and post those and um, promote them in different places to get your friends and family doing citizen science. I see some um, people in the chat are coming on in. They're saying um, their names. That's awesome where they're calling in from. Keep on introducing yourself in the chat. That would just be fantastic. Um, so I, I like to play this video because I'm a numbers person. And um, I, I think it's really compelling. The video is about a year old, but it still has some good statistics. So on SciStarter, where I work, there are over 2,000 projects listed. So people go to SciStarter to put their projects on there to solicit volunteers. eBirds listed on SciStarter too. That's a project where you can take bird observations. And that's really important. One big bird count we do in the States every year is, was classified as a leading indicator of climate change. Um, so citizen science research is really important. We know that um, flowers are appearing earlier, so seasons are changing because of citizen science data, we know that. And iNaturalist, over 92% of butterfly and moth records in GBIF are from iNaturalist. So, um, and also we found that um, citizen scientists speed up researcher time. So, and we're able to do research faster as a scientific community. That's my little by the numbers video. I wanted to show this video too. Um, this is a little bit more in the weeds. So let me quickly explain what SciStarter, I, I think I've mentioned a little bit what SciStarter is, but we're a place where we connect regular people to the real science they can do. So you can go to SciStarter, make an account, and then you can see all these different projects people have added. And then typically you go elsewhere to do that project. So for example, you'd make your SciStarter account, then you'd um, search for a project on SciStarter. You'd be like, I want a project where I can go outside and take pictures of butterflies. And then um, iNaturalist would come as an option. So then you'd click on the iNaturalist project and you'd leave SciStarter to go join it. Um, but when you do that, SciStarter will automatically in your dashboard keep a record of all the projects you've joined. And um, for some projects like iNaturalist, they've gone the extra mile and become SciStarter affiliates, meaning that um, they allow you to track the number and frequency of your contributions in your SciStarter dashboard. And that's something we did by request for our communities because they wanted to be able to say, I made 600 contributions to stall catchers and 300 contributions to iNaturalist. And that's just for them, they're able to demonstrate their volunteer work. So I'm gonna quickly play this video just so you can see on your screen how you can add your, um, size, your iNaturalist username to your SciStarter dashboard. There we go. So you go and log in to SciStarter. And you go to your info and settings. 
And that's where you input your iNaturalist username. So simple enough, right? So feel free um, if you're inspired by this to make a SciStarter account so you can keep on tracking your participation to other awesome projects. Then you can make an iNaturalist account and add your iNaturalist username to your SciStarter info and settings. And another fun fact with the SciStarter project finder, you can search by location. So um, let's say that you're in Bangladesh and you want a project that's specifically for Bangladesh. You can search for projects that are Bangladesh only. Um, one example of a project I found that was really cool in Asia was there's a project called the Pakistani Air Quality Project, where um, it, he, he seems like a really inspiring person, the person who leads the project, but it's a project just about how to measure air quality in Pakistan. So some projects are global, like iNaturalist or stall catchers, you could do it anywhere in the world, and some projects are hyper-local, and all of them are really important. So um, I mentioned the project finder, how you can search for different projects on SciStarter. And very specifically to our times, because I know some of you may be in countries where you're supposed to practice, you know, physical or social distancing and leave the house in the minimum. You could search for projects that are indoor only and online only if you need to. Or you can do a project like iNaturalist and just follow public health guidelines. So I know where I'm based in Washington, D.C., I'm going to be doing iNaturalist this weekend for the City Nature Challenge. I'll just make sure to be six feet apart from the next person as I'm outside taking my observations. Um, this is the SciStarter dashboard I mentioned, so you can track your projects in here. And this is our Citizen Science Month microsite. So you can find more online events like this one on citizenSciencemonth.org. And with that being said, I just wanted to thank you, um, the global citizen science community, for all the amazing work you've been doing in April. We've taken air quality observations globally. Um, we've had people doing astronomy. There are projects that literally address COVID-19 that we've done as part of Citizen Science Month at SciStarter.org forward slash COVID-19. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you again and keep up the great work. And we'd love to keep on seeing the amazing work you're doing. You can tag Sit Sci Month on Instagram and Twitter. And also I know Citizen Science Asia has Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook accounts as well. So keep on tagging them too. Um, and thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it over to our next speaker. Thanks, Caroline. Yes, yeah, so now I want to ask Mindel Wong and Scott if they can introduce um, Citizen Science Asia a little bit to everyone and what the community of Citizen Science Asia is. Scott, Mindel, are you here? Uh, yeah, so um, we're going to do this tag team and I'll do the first six slides and then Mendel will do the second. So could, uh, oh, do I have permission to share screen? Let's see. Um, does this work? Yep, it's working. All right, great. So, um, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks, SciStar. So thanks, Caroline, for uh, helping this. We've been talking about uh, <laughs> webinars for a long time, so it's great that it's, uh, it, it's finally happening. Um, hello, world from Asia. Um, so this will just be a little introduction. Like, you know, Caroline's done a great introduction on, on what is citizen science. So we don't need to cover that so much. We can just give a bit of a, 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 some context on, 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 the, on Asia, on the organization in Asia, and um, also you know, talk a bit about biodiversity because today is about Asian biodiversity. Um, yeah, so um, as uh, Caroline said, you know, it's Citizen Science Month. Um, we had a lot of fun do it, doing a takeover of the um, Sit Sci Month uh, of the Sit Sci Month social media, you know, social media feeds and stuff. Um, so it's great that we could kind of like keep up keep up the momentum and 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 um, and do an event for the month. So um, yeah, we've had a bit of a, a, a introduction on um, on citizen science. There's a few things in the chat. Okay, is everything okay? All right, yeah, people are saying hello. Um, so uh, I don't need to cover that, but you know, why is citizen science important in Asia? Um, well, in, in we have a long, long history here, right? The, um, 
things like the cherry blossom, um, cherry blossom counts in Japan have gone back over a thousand years. Um, citizens have collected data on uh, swarms of locusts for, for thousands of years in China. Um, it's not a, it's not a new it's not a new concept here, um, and, but it's it's an important one, right? In the there's a lot of discussion, a lot of you know stuff happens in citizen science in 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 Europe, in North America, in Australasia, but you know mustn't forget about Asia. You know we have 50 countries and 60 percent of the world's population here, um, but we can um, be a bit underrepresented in a lot of these conversations. Um, and citizen science, this stuff is really needed here. There are huge, you know, we have this massive populations and we have um, massive challenges because of climate change, pollution, loss of biodiversity here. So it's very important to um, engage, develop and coordinate at Asia amongst all of these other projects and things going on in the kind of international uh, citizen science movement. Um, so um, this is a great uh, a map that shows the global biodiversity, right? So red, if you look, if you look on the, if you look on the map here, red means this is where all of the biodiversity is. But if you actually, and Asia is like very, you know, most of this biodiversity is in, in like South America, South and Central America, Africa, and, and, uh, and the Southern equatorial bits of Asia. But if you look at the amount of, the, the completeness of biodiversity records, right? What the, what the academics going out and, and um, ca cataloging, well, you know, biodiversity. And, you know, to protect biodiversity, you have to catalog it. Unfortunately, this is all clustered to North America, Europe, and a bit of Australia, right? The biodiverse places are the least complete in terms of their biodiversity records. And so we need to fill those gaps, right? It's really crucial to, um, to, catalog, to, to catalog this stuff so we know what, we're, what we need to protect. And citizens have uh, an amazing you know, potential and opportunity to, to do this. Um, and so uh, Mendel and I, we're based in Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong is pretty typical in this for, for, for somewhere like Asia, so, you know, the world in general, that the citizens are far outpacing the, the academics, right? The professional researchers in, in cataloging biodiversity. Um, you'll hear a bit about the, the GBIF database. The, this is the kind of like global database for, for biodiversity and the vast majority of research grade observations there are from citizen science projects. From In Hong Kong, the number one project is eBird, number two source is iNaturalist. Um, and this is like 300 times more than Hong Kong University, our academics. Our school, we have we've been doing, so on top of um, City Nature Challenge, which you'll hear about later, a lot of this is driven through school challenges. One of, one of the schools in Hong Kong managed to make 10,000 observations just on their own. This is 10 times more than Hong Kong University, for example. And um, so that was my introduction. Can I can hand over to Mendel now. All right, thanks, Scott. All right, let me just share my screen over here. Great. So yeah, just to pick up where Scott left off. Um, yeah, in terms of just um, what Citizen Science Asia is all about, it's the organization that Scott and I founded in the interest of sort of filling that gap, as he just sort of explained. Obviously, Asia is a quite critical piece to making sure, um, given sort of the population, given um, the size, geography, given the history, there's a lot of reasons why Asia can contribute quite a bit. Um, to citizen science. Um, so what have we been doing as an organization since we founded it um, two and a half years ago now, actually almost three years now. So we've been iterating over the strategy. Um, we've managed to find volunteers to come help build on those ideas. And we've came up with um, three pillars effectively, um, conceptually sort of to 
um, get us to where we need to be. And that's what I'll sort of just go through very briefly here. Um, so one of the first things that we talked about is building up the community. Um, the idea here being Asia in itself um, is not naturally sort of one cohesive unit, um, unlike sort of the North America, whether it's US or US and Canada, or Europe sort of as a coalition. Um, so one of the challenges we have is trying to bring a very massive distribution of people um, across a number of um, sort of culture and sort of socioeconomic differences, and therefore also a lot of different cultural and um, diverse perspectives, trying to build a community to be in unison in these conversations at an international level. Just as a by way of explanation of how this came to be, um, when Scott and I were running a specific citizen science project and we got invited to a global collaboration around these mosquito-borne disease issues, one of the things that we found was that there was no one at, from Asia at the table. And the reason being, it's really hard to get very eclectic people from all over the place, given sort of people have their own individual agendas all over. So one of the things that we decided that was necessary is that we really need to sort of find the commonality between us and Asia so that these conversations can also incorporate um, a perspective from Asia. Whilst there's a, a whole lot of differences, there's also a need to sort of have a unified view um, given there's a lot of commonality in that. So building the community here, connecting the people was sort of one aspect that was super important. And amongst the large population we have here, we decided that the initial focus really is around the people who are already doing citizen science. So we're initially trying to build those relationships with people running projects. They understand what a citizen scientist is, but at the same time, we're also organically doing sort of active outreach so that the general public is educated around what we do and hopefully can sort of join this community. Um, a second pillar, a little bit more um, general and sort of um, very, I suppose, appropriate in this type of space, building capacity. So what does that mean? Citizen science is not necessarily new in terms of what it is. Terminology wise, I think there's a, it's a, it's a newer nomenclature, but we've been doing it for a long time as um, Scott alluded to. Um, but still, I think there's still a lack of understanding what it's about. Um, and even more importantly, a lack of resources um, that contributes towards it. And one of the things that we have found in our journey such as, so far um, from where we started when we found the organization is that as we sort of collaborate with the international counterparts, one of the things that we found is that there are a lot of people um, top down who understand the benefit of leveraging citizen science um, in terms of solutions. And one of the places is around the sustainable development goals um, that the UN is driving for 2030. So we're fortunate enough to be working with them um, at that very top level. Um, but the understanding is that in order for in order to leverage citizen science, you really need to have the community all be working because the whole point is the collective whole that makes a difference. So how do we sort of build the platform um, so that Asia can actually ha leverage all the number of people we have here um, to sort of transform the, the the quantity into something useful that can be coordinated to the community. So building that capacity on how we sort and organize all that information is super critical. So we're still working out a lot of that. We have a lot more questions and answers, but we're sort of working through that as one of the pillars. Um, and part of that is also in terms of building capacity is not so much just how do you convert the logistics of all that information, but also is sort of to some degree cultural or uh, a mindset where in, in the East, there is a lot of assumptions around things are usually driven top down. So you look to the government, you look to the governing body, tell you what you're supposed to be doing. Whereas in the West, there's a slightly different general mindset. Okay, well, each individual can contribute. So part of the mi mindset in terms of knowledge sharing is also just trying to get people to shift their mindset. Hey, everyone can contribute to the solution. You don't really need to wait to be told. So that's also something that I'm working through in terms of building capacity, because fundamentally, all these individuals need to be sort of open to it for the system to actually work in, in capacity and to be scalable. Um, the last area that we've been sort of focusing in is sort of the a latter half of this as we build up a community and having the capacity is really building the conversations. So part of this is really um, obviously raising awareness in general. A lot of the things around climate um, um, issues now is, is all about sort of having those conversations and people being aware before you can sort of move forward on action. So part of the, what we're trying to do as well is building up on the other two pillars is really helping um, promote and raise awareness and then working towards really encouraging partnerships um, with various entities here um, so that people understand, look, 
yes, it's it's a, it's a problem that needs to be solved, but how are you starting with it? Um, part of it is understanding, well, you know what, you can use leverage open data, you can leverage the citizen science data, and with that, you can define the problem in a much more succinct way, then we can sort of work together at that point in terms of having those conversations on working towards a solution. And so that's sort of a, a next step, just because there's a lot of things to be done before we can actually have these sort of productive concrete material conversations, whether it's social entrepreneurs or policymakers in the, in the area. And obviously there's a lot of different governments, policymakers that we're talking about, at least in the Asia space. So that is something that would need a bit of focus in order to get traction. So those are sort of the three main pillars um, in concept that we're focusing as an organization. So what have we really been doing over the last two and a half years and looking forward, these are just some of the areas that we've sort of um, worked on and achieved in light of those sort of three areas. Um, first of all, as, a, as I mentioned, we managed to find a lot of volunteers to be, to be part of this leadership team, which is divvied up into a few different um, specific pillars um, of work to be done. One of them is engagement, which Adrian, who's hosting this call, is um, running. Effectively, is really just doing outreach to the individuals in the region so that we can understand what challenges they have, let them know what resources and help we can provide. Platform, um, we sort of skipped over that a little bit in, uh, in terms of detail as far as um, capacity is concerned, but part of it is just having a platform to be able to have information sharing, whether that to some degree is having a place that actually has all the resources as simple as a website, but also potentially a place to connect, whether it's for finding volunteers um, for projects, whether it's having material that can be translated so it can be re-leveraged. Um, there are a lot of things from a technology standpoint as a platform needs to be um, looked into. Education has sort of touched on both as far as um, changing people's mindset, but also just more fundamentally from a science standpoint, just educating people about how do you go out and do citizen science? How do you approach it in a scientific manner? And finally, part, um, partnership is what I was alluding to, where we need to build some of those connections, whether it's really with um, governmental sort of entities or whether those are private um, companies. So a lot of that is understanding at a group level organizations that we can work with to proceed, um, proceed with some of these um, goals. Um, so far over the two and a half years, um, aside from sort of leads that are taking on for those strategy pillars, we also have managed to sort of assign people to be ambassadors. We do have 10 official ambassadors across um, we call them chapters just because we don't really want it to be defined by national borders per se. And there are some debates of that in Asia, as you guys know. So really chapters just meaning an area within Asia as, as a sub region. Um, it's 10 plus because while some areas may not have formerly an ambassador, we do have potentially members um, sort of sprinkled through those areas or people we're sort of in conversation with who can potentially take on the lead role. Um, but all in all, we sort of spread out across all the way from Japan across to um, obviously as we have on this call um, to Bangladesh and Pakistan as well. Um, sort of touched on our efforts in the international space. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is being the Asia representation of sort of this global partnership. And I'll come to that in a second. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then finally, the last couple of things is really what we've been doing as things like this, um, trying to share the things that people are doing in this region. A lot of times for citizen science work, I think a lot of the stuff in the US and Europe or Australia is quite well known. And there's a lot of people who understand it and there's a big network and sharing that information. Whereas in Asia, it's sort of pockets of area. So one thing we're trying to do is break down those barriers and highlight things that are interesting and being done here. Um, aside from highlighting is also just letting people know if there's a potentially duplicate or similar work being done is hopefully people find synergy and sort of don't have to reinvent the wheel in certain cases if, if necessary. Um, but yeah, uh, but still lots to do. Um, the roadmaps slowed down quite a bit uh, over the last months, um, given Scott and I are in Hong Kong uh, with back-to-back -back issues. So we'll have to see how, where, where that goes, but there's definitely a lot more things to continue in those three conceptual areas that we're talking about. So just a few highlights here. Uh, obviously, one of the things is around connecting people across Asia and the world. Uh, the top half is just um, a sub-selection of the people who are, who've been on the leadership team. So we've been very fortunate with these people volunteering in their own time um, to help um, be sort of um, um, brainstorming and thinking through sort of strategies on how we could improve um, the space. Um, we've been putting together a digital community on a platform called Mobilize. Um, we sent out our first newsletter um, uh, five, six months back, and we're obviously needing to get more of those out, but hopefully there's an area where people can sort of convene and um, discuss projects and such. 
Um, as I mentioned, um, this whole global partnership, this is the thing that as an entity, which is the entity informing, which is effectively us working alongside our counterparts, whether it's the Citizen Science Association in the Americas, there's a European version, there's an Australian version, there's ones that are up and coming in sort of the South Americas and also in the um, Africa regions. So the idea being, um, there's, it's not possible for the UN to be able to work with all individual projects, all individuals across the world. So there needs to be some sort of strategic collaboration. And the idea is that through these um, network of networks, um, this is the Citizen Science Global Partnership, they could then work with us holistically um, on how to drive citizen science as part of the solution towards SDG. Um, and then one of the main things I want to highlight on this is just the numerous resources that we've been putting together, content and resources over the last um, two years. Um, so we do have a YouTube channel, we do have a Medium article where people um, submit their own stories. So just a summary of links of things you guys can refer to and we can provide these afterwards. Um, as I mentioned, there's the Mobilized Community, which um, everyone who's not already on there can join it. It's as simple as join us as science.asia. Um, we already mentioned about the journal, the YouTube channels. We have the usual sort of social media presence, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. So feel free to join any of those if you're on them. And finally, we do have a simple fact sheet um, of things that sort of summarize um, some of the things we just went through. And if not, um, send us an email, info Asia, or you can go to the, um, the web link there, which at the moment just um, leverages Facebook. All right. Adrian, thank I'll pass you. It. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mandel, and thank you, Scott. So yeah, we, as a member of Citizen Science Asia, we are really excited about having this webinar also to meet new people and add to our community. So if you're interested and think that your project um, is really cool and want to share it with us and share it with the rest of the world, you can um, please join our, our community and we can uh, help you promote it as well. And if you don't have a project, but you're interested, come join our community anyways. We can uh, have discussions and you can meet new people doing projects, maybe get connected with projects in your area. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to see all of these comments and all of these new people joining the webinar.